just a few comments before I start. I just want to say William Paley and CBS are larger subjects than I ever imagined when I first started uh, uh, to research this talk. But here goes. It was 1951 when CBS introduced its world famous Seeing Eye logo to American audiences. William S. Paley was the father of modern broadcasting. He built CBS from a small radio station into the most powerful communications network in the world. Paley, more than any other early figure of broadcasting, was fascinated by entertainment. He was also devoted to the rapidly changing technology seen in communications during the middle of the 20th century. That's Paley adjusting the camera. It was Paley who determined what the nation first heard on the radio and then saw on television at home every night. As a baby boomer raised in the 1950s and 60s, my family and, a lot, and everybody else were glued to TV. How TV became a maker of public tastes can be told as the story of just one broadcasting network, CBS and of its founder and unbeatable CEO and chairman, William Paley. That's the former CBS building called the Black Rock on Sixth Avenue in New York City. Paley paired his deep attraction to the entertainment world with the most advanced technology. Bill's personal fortune was worth more than $500 million by the end of his life. He earned this over many decades while turning CBS into his personal golden candy store. Here is Bill with his second wife, Babe Paley, a well-known fashion icon. Author Sally Bedell Smith takes a harsh view of Paley in her 1990 biography saying, he was better at personifying his self-created legend than he was at creating excellence for himself or his television network. She continues, Paley ignored his family, destroyed the careers of many businessmen and died friendless. That may or may not be true, but he was without a doubt, a major influence on the 20th century. Why am I talking about Bill Paley today? He came to my attention recently when his historic summer house in Southampton called Four Fountains made the news. New owners were successful in having its demolition approved because of major wood rot. The new owners thankfully agreed to respect its facade and reconstruct as much as possible. But let's begin with Bill's origins. The Paley family in the mid 19th century were prosperous Jews from the Ukraine, then part of the Russian empire. The family became prosperous in the booming lumber business created by the rapidly developing railroad system. That changes in 1881 after the assassination of Tsar Alexander II. This causes a major turning point in Jewish history. The Tsar had been a liberal. His son, Alexander III, reverses his father's attempt at modernization and reform to install an autocratic rule. Jews were blamed for the assassination, which brings about anti-Semitic rioting and scapegoating known as pogroms. These occurred throughout the empire. Over 2 million Jews leave Russia at this time with the majority coming to the United States. The impoverished Paley's immigrate to Chicago. His father, Samuel, takes a job as a lector in a cigar factory, meaning he reads books and newspapers to workers while they roll cigars, which of course is a very tedious job. In 1896, Samuel and his brother Jacob opened the Congress Cigar Company in a Jewish neighborhood in Chicago. The company is probably named after its location on Congress Street, which at that time was a prominent business strip. Bill is born in 1901 in, an, in the apartment above the store with his father Sam, mother Goldie, and a sister named Blanche. The brothers make and sell many cigar brands, with the most successful being La Palina, named after Samuel's wife, Goldie. 
Lapalina is a feminized form of the name Polly. My grandfather was a serious cigar smoker who would give me his empty boxes. I am sure I had this one. Paley attends public school until his senior year of high school when his parents enroll him in the Western Military Academy where his interest in entertainment begins. A school brochure states that the Academy will arrange every year a series of musical entertainments to relieve the monotony of school life. Paley may have participated. At the age of 12, he distinguishes himself by adding the initial S to his name, possibly to impress his father, Samuel. After graduating from the Academy in 1918, Paley attends the University of Chicago, founded by the American Baptist Society and John D. Rockefeller. Bill becomes friends with Rockefeller's sons, Nelson and David, maybe then, but certainly many years later. By the 1920s, Samuel and Jacob become millionaires and move their families to Philadelphia. Bill transfers to the Wharton School of Finance at the University of Pennsylvania, where he graduates with a science degree. Classes are held in College Hall, the oldest building on campus. Bill works at the Congress Cigar Company throughout his youth, sweeping floors and running errands. After graduating from Wharton, Bill immediately takes a management position in the Congress Cigar Company. During the next several years, Paley shows an impressive grasp of business principles and an instinct for making smart decisions. Business is great. By 1926, the cigar company has seven factories in four states, employing over 4,000 people and producing over 250 million cigars a year. That's 700,000 cigars a day. That's a lot. The Paley's experiment with promoting La Palina on the radio, a medium still in its infancy. The ads are very successful. They pay $6,500 a week to sponsor a radio show in Philadelphia called La Palina Hour, and sales increase 150%. This convinces Bill, now director of marketing, that commercial radio has a huge potential, even bigger than cigars. At the age of 26, Bill is a millionaire. He invests one half of his fortune by purchasing the Columbia Broadcasting System, a network of 16 radio stations in New Jersey and New York. By 1929, Paley moves to New York City and quickly signs up 49 additional radio stations. He offers them more program time with less advertising. In a masterstroke, he eliminates the fee with the assurance that their commercials will be heard by more people. He also insists that affiliates have the latest RCA equipment. With radio stations in his hand, talent comes next. Bill begins by changing program content from highbrow music to more mainstream tastes like the Paul Whiteman Band, the most popular jazz band of the 1920s. Whiteman commissions George Gershwin to write Rhapsody in Blue. CBS broadcasts Duke Ellington live from the Cotton Club in Harlem. Ellington writes Blue Mood Indigo, the first tune he writes for radio transmission it becomes a jazz standard. Singers for the Duke include Paul Robeson and Billie Holiday. Paley's life takes a dramatic turn about this time when he meets Dorothy Hart Hurst, a glamorous figure in New York society who is married to the alcoholic son of William Randolph Hearst. Paley is smitten and four days later, after she, days, after she divorces Hearst, they marry. They have two children, Jeffrey and Hillary. Although seven years younger, Dorothy is more worldly than Paley and runs in sophisticated society, including the Algonquin set, 
which includes New York's elite writers, Dorothy Parker, Noel Coward, Robert Benchley, and Joseph Mankiewicz. Dorothy has an enormous impact on Bill with her liberal political leanings with an appetite for news. She supports FDR's New Deal reforms during the Depression. But Bill is a well-known philanderer. One of his friends says, he was not a woman lover, he was a womanizer. Paley has a one-year affair with the silent screen star, Louise Brooks, who is known as the It Girl. He continues to support Louise for the rest of her life. Dorothy Bill divorces Bill in 1947 for infidelity. One day in 1930, Paley turns on his office speaker to hear an audition of four young men known as the Mills Brothers. He immediately puts them on the air. The next day, the Mills Brothers sign a three-year contract. They become the first African-Americans to have a network show on radio heard in the New York region. Paley aggressively pursues and signs all the best talent, including a young crooner named Bing Crosby and comedians Jack Benny, George Burns, and Gracie Allen. One of the most popular radio programs of the 1930s and 40s is Kate Smith Sings. Paley says he selects her because he is not the type of woman, she is not the type of woman to provoke jealousy in American housewives. Lux Radio Theater begins in 1934 by performing live before a studio audience. The latest film scripts are read by Hollywood movie stars and stage plays are read by Broadway theater actors. Some of the movie stars perfor performing on Lux Radio during its very long run include Katherine Hepburn, Humphrey Bogart, and Elizabeth Taylor. By 1935, CBS is the largest radio network in the United States. That's French on Tone and his wife, Joan Crawford, reading a script from one of their movies. In 1937, Louis Armstrong substitutes crooner Rudy Valley and becomes the first African-American to host a national broadcast. Paley buys Columbia Records, who introduced the long-playing LP in 1948 with over 40 minutes of recording time. Columbia record stars, Columbia recording stars include Doris Day, Frank Sinatra, and Beyonce. Family adventure programs are heard, sometimes daily. Gene Autry's Melody Ranch, Buck Rogers from the 25th century, and the adventures of prize fighter Joe Palooka. During World War II, Paley serves in the Office of War Information in the Mediterranean, and later he becomes Chief of Radio in the Psychological Warf Warfare Division. Paley's success in entertainment is equal to a fierce commitment to news. He meets Edward R. Murrow in London at the beginning of the war and hires him to be the voice of CBS News. Murrow escorts his boss around London making sure that he dines with the right people. After the war, Murrow produces a TV special on Senator Joe McCarthy's Red Scare hearings. Murrow uses excerpts from McCarthy's own speeches to criticize him and point out accusations where he contradicts himself. Where is Ed Murrow today? The broadcast contributes to a nationwide backlash against McCarthy and is a turning point in the history of television. Paley is newly divorced from Dorothy Hurst in 1947 and is eager to increase his profile. He finds a new love. The Cushing sisters, long before the Kardashians, captivate America by marrying prominent men in the Roosevelt, ba Vanderbilt, and Astor families. That's Babe Cushing on the left. Could be your right. Not sure which. Babe's debut in 1938 in Boston was attended by FDR's sons, 
she captured the public's fascination during the Great Depression and becomes a media star. That's a stunning photo. Babe works at Vogue magazine. Babe works at Vogue magazine as a fashion editor and quickly draws the attention of fashion photographers Horst, Eisenstadt, Avedon, Cecil Beaton, and Slim Ahrens. In 1940, Babe marries socially prominent sportsman Stanley Mortimer at St. Luke's Church in East Hampton. Vogue magazine covers the wedding. They have two children before divorcing in 1946. Bill, pa Bill Paley marries Babe Cushing Mortimer in 1947 and have two additional children. Surprisingly, I can find no photos of their wedding and only a handful of these two together during their marriage. Paley is very wealthy with an interest in the arts and a desire to be a part of New York's high society. As a Jew, Babe's social connections give him a greater chance of being accepted. That's Wallace Simpson, uh, Duchess of Windsor with the Paley's. Paley offers wealth, security, and worldliness. Babe devotes herself to entertaining and keeping a flawless appearance. She is famous for saying, one can never be too rich or too thin. 1951 was a transition year for CBS moving from radio to TV. Peggy Lee hosts her own radio show in New York and at the same time appears on many live TV shows like the Perry Como Show and Ed Sullivan Variety Shows. This was Lee's candlelight and furs era, singing straight and painstakingly slow, as if in slow motion, stimulating imaginations nationwide. That same year, CBS president Frank Stanton declares the CBS logo isn't stylish enough. He tells creative de director William Golden to create something new. Golden finds his in inspiration in a book of Shaker drawings that show the all-seeing eye of God. You can see up there in that illustration. He creates the famous eye logo, one of the world's most famous brands. The logo morphs many times over the years. The eye changes but to this day, the perfectly balanced design remains unchanged. This version is used during the 1990s. The all-seeing all logo has its own exhibit titled Revolution of the Eye, Modern Art and the Birth of American Television, which is at the Jewish Museum in New York City in 2015. In 1948, Lucille Ball, Hollywood star whose movie career is declining performs with Richard Denning in My Favorite Husband on Lux Radio. The show is a hit. CBS develops it into I Love Lucy in 1951, which also becomes wildly popular. Paley's creativity, though, is sometimes inconsistent. He objects to Desi Arnaz on the air, being on the air because he is Cuban. It was Ball who insists that her real life husband play her stage husband. The Ed Sullivan Show begins in 1948. He fights against racial discrimination by regularly showcasing African, African Americans. During the 1950s, he shocks the nation when he gives Pearl Bailey a kiss on the cheek and also shakes Nat King Cole's hand on the air. There are no photographs of that, unfortunately. Paley asked his staff to develop an adult, hard-boiled Western series. Gunsmoke runs for 20 years, often as the number one show. It was Bill Paley's favorite. 73 million people watch Ed Sullivan introduce the Beatles in 1964 which uh, proves to be one third of the US population. Beatlemania awakens a generation to British music and style. The Beatles continue to inspire. In 2019, three years ago, the group's music is streamed 850 million times 
by people under 30 years of age. In 1964, Paley buys the New York Yankees. His son, William C. Paley, says while growing up, my dad never had time to play baseball with me, but he owned the Yankees. The Dick Van Dyke Show is on the air for six years and is ranked number 13 on TV Guide's greatest shows of all time. In 1959, uh, James Aubrey becomes president of CBS. He steers the network to become the most popular channel on television with shows like The Beverly Hillbillies, Gillian's Island, and Petticoat Junction. By 1971, all the rule theme shows are popular but are canceled. Young people are not watching them. This is a scene from Green Acres. God, I love that show. All in the Family also airs in 1971 and breaks ground, depicting racism, anti Semitism, infidelity, homosexuality, breast cancer, and abortion. Paley thinks it's vulgar and wants it canceled. Luckily, it survives to become television's most influential comedy. The Jeffersons open in 1975 and is the longest running TV show led by an African-American actors. It has a mixed race cast. During the 70s, Bay Paley is lonely and frustrated as Bill carries on a chain of affairs which takes a toll on her and her family. She is consistently under the scrutiny of society and the media who pressures her into maintaining an unrealistic image of perfection. These external pressures, as well as a two day, as well as a two pack a day cigarette habit finally affect her health. She dies at 63 in 1978. Her one-time friend, Truman Capote says, Bay Paley had only one fault. She was perfect. Otherwise, she was perfect. Bill buys four fountains in Southampton after selling another Long Island estate that he and Babe had shared. Bill says, that old house was filled with memories that I guess depressed me. William S. Paley dies in 1990. He was a, a genius possessed of enough energy to propel a dozen brilliant careers, generous, thoughtful, and vital. Above all, he was charming. Those speaking at his funeral were David Rockefeller, Henry Kissinger, and Walter Cronkite. Attendees included Oscar de la Renta, Dan Rather, Alan Alda, and the cream of entertainment and political worlds. Here is former President Richard Nixon entering Temple Manuel on Fifth Avenue. He leaves the bulk of his massive art collection to the Museum of Modern Art, including works by Matisse, Degas, Renoir, and Picasso. Here you can see Picasso's boy leading a horse in the background, which was hanging in their New York City apartment. In the words of Frank N. Stanton, the president of CBS said, he was too complex. The history of Bill Paley and CBS is too enormous for me to cover in this short presentation. There are several published biographies about the man, but the one I would highly recommend is titled In All His Glory by Sally Bedell Smith, which I, which I have borrowed from extensively. Thank you for listening. <laughs>